you know, markets don't move in a straight line. Um, you know, I, I've, I've said for years that gold will eventually get to five thousand dollars. I've said for years that the Dow will eventually get to sixty thousand um, dollars. I've said for years that the dollar will go to its all-time high of one hundred and fifty. That doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. I think you have to be ready for it to happen tomorrow, but it's probably going to take another four or five years for this all to play out. But we're definitely in kind of what we're in. We're in, we're in an ascending part of of that thesis. Uh, but I think people now because. Everybody kind of feels like they're bulletproof now. Equity people feel like they're bulletproof. Bitcoin people feel like they're bulletproof. Gold people feel like they're bulletproof. Silver people think they're, you know, Superman all of a sudden. And, you know, nobody thinks that they can get hurt. But, you know, just about the time you think that nobody can get hurt, that's when you do. Hey everybody, welcome back to Milkshakes Markets Madness. It's been quite a week for all three. Now, before we get into all the madness, all the emotion, and all the brilliant forecasters who've gotten everything right their entire life, um, we are going to start with the macro, um, at least just general economic data. This week had, uh, had quite a bit of it. And next week, you know, there's even more stuff coming up. So before we get into Brent's take, on everything that transpired this past week, particularly in the gold market, uh, commodities market, et cetera. Uh, Brent, let's look at um, the employment data because although we did have some activity in the equity market, which you're welcome to opine on, I think the big data point um, was employment. Uh, do you have anything um, specific that you want to address about the NFP non-farm payroll? Yeah, and I think it was like, it was kind of the perfect cap to the week because it was kind of a volatile week kind of a maddening worry week. You know, people were kind of uh, getting over their skis, uh, I would say, position-wise, both emotion-wise, a little bit of everything, you know. And we've got March Madness and the basketball coming to an head. We've got the Final Four this weekend. But I thought Friday was kind of a very good wrap-up of the whole week because what you had on Friday was, you know, we've gotten to the point where everybody is now expecting rate cuts just a matter of when. And so the big data points feed into when are they going to cut rates. And so everybody's watching non-farm payrolls. And non-farm payrolls comes out with another huge beat, which has been happening pretty regularly. But then we've also talked about how then they come in a month or two later and they revise these down dramatically. And initially, because it was a big beat, the headline of it, markets sell off, you know, dollar rallies a little bit, um, yields rise, uh, bonds sell off. And because this means they're probably going to cut rates. Um, or I'm sorry, bonds rallied a little bit because they're probably going to cut rates. But, you know, didn't take too long. Maybe it was 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour. But And, you know, you start looking into the details of the non-farm payrolls. And again, it's all temp jobs. It's all, it's it's not, you know, it's, it, it's multiple jobs. It's not high pay jobs that are increasing. And the, the almost the entire rate was based on, you know, kind of part-time jobs and stuff. And so the market kind of dismissed it pretty quickly. And the market had sold off kind of on some geopolitical fears uh, the day before, and then basically made most of those gains or most of the, the losses from Thursday back uh, on Friday. And so by the end of the week, you know, everything's at its high. And Bitcoin's almost at its high. You know, the Dow's at its high. S&P's at its high. Um, you know, the NASDAQ's at its high. Gold had a very big week. Gold And silver had an even bigger week. So to me, though, and, and the miners, gold, silver, and the miners, those were the standouts this week. And I think part of it is that they're finally catching up um, to what the other assets have been doing for a long time. And so I, I think we'll talk more about uh, those here in a little bit. But um, again, it was this kind of, uh, you know, again, the, the market wants to go higher. The market is saying they're going to cut rates. We don't know when they're going to cut rates, but they're going to cut. And so we're gonna, we want to be in risk assets and be positioned when the rates come. And as a result, you know, we, we've got we've got everything at its high or very close to its high. One of the things I want to preface here for people is when you're in front of the camera, your thoughts are flowing and you're kind of a couple steps ahead of yourself because you're you want to be concise and you want to get your idea across. Some, sometimes you you say the wrong word um, and you don't actually hear yourself saying the wrong word. So I just want to be clear, because as you were talking about that, you had referenced um, kind of a, the bond market reaction and you had implied that they were reacting to the likelihood that um, because of non-farm payroll, 
that the Fed would cut. Um, I don't know if you actually meant that because the non-farm payroll was with the higher number, the beat. It actually implied more that the likelihood that the Fed wouldn't be cutting. Right. Um, right. Sorry. I, I think I spoke wrong. I apologize. Okay. So we're clear on that. Mainly what you were focused on, what you're thinking about is the fact that the way the market processed this report um, it was ultimately, you know, chewed up and spit back out by the equity markets and everything remained high. I mean, really, let's let's be clear about the point that's being made here. The only one who has been a continuous loser the last two years has been the bond market. And so we, before we get into uh, commodities, particularly gold and silver, finally catching up, um, do you have any thoughts on on, you know, just generally what the bond market's future might be, even if that's the next six to 12 months, depending on what the Fed does, whether they, they stay flat all year or if they do sneak in one cut? Well, my guess is that yields are going to stay higher for long. Again, I think the Fed wants to cut. I don't think that they're going to cut as much. That, at the beginning of the year, of course, there was the Magnificent Seven, you know, the Magnificent Seven rate cuts that were going to come. And that has been kind of thrown by the wayside. And now I, I'm not even sure what, maybe they're pricing in one or two more at this point. Um, but I, it, I'm not even sure we're going to get one or two. I kind of feel like we're going to get one just because I think they want to cut. But in general, I think the government is going to keep running these huge budget deficits. Um, I think there's going to be pressure on yields to rise unless we get a crashy market, some kind of a crisis where, you know, everything flows into treasuries as some kind of a safety bit. Um, then I think yields would come down, but that's not my base case. So I don't rule it out, but that's not my base case. And I think in general, yields are going to be higher for longer. And it won't shock me at all if the the ten year gets back to five percent on, on on U.S. Treasuries. So I don't think it's I don't I don't think it's a it's an easy I don't think buying bonds right here is an easy trade. Well, look, everything is climbing higher, as you mentioned the the miners, which is usually at least for some time now, the last one to join the party. Um, everyone was watching gold and silver finally, you know, catch a tailwind. And that kept going. You have gold at all time highs. Um, silver still lagging when it comes to all time highs. But in terms of, you know, the since the, the, the large pullback in 2011, this is the highest it's been on, on its climb back up to all time highs. Um, it feels to me, and I think now may be a good time to transition into some of the things we've been seeing this week. It feels like the narrative, um, which has been wrong for the last two years since the Fed has started raising rates, is that there is a crash coming. And the specific crash is really this like end of the world for the US, end of the world for, for governments and their fiscal profligacy and the misuse of, of debt and fiat. And therefore, that's why gold's at 2300 and that's why silver is climbing back to 20, uh, $28. And that's why oil's back to 90. And if you miss this, you know, enjoy staying poor because gold's going to 5,000 and everything else is following. So, you know, can you get kicked off now with us on this idea of what has been driving the emotion behind all of this and where you, you kind of see some of the disconnects um, from people's emotion and what the market has been doing so far. Yeah, well, I think part of it is that one of the things that's really interesting with gold and silver this last week is that the yields have stayed high. You know, again, bonds have not rallied much. And, and you, I mean, over the last couple of years, they've fallen dramatically. And what we just talked about, they, 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 they could fall more. One of the arguments, that the reason gold and silver had not broken out uh, prior to this was that yields were high. And a lot of times, if yields are high and inflation is low, then you have positive real rates and that is a headwind for gold, right? And so, you know, because gold is a non-yielding instrument. And so if you can get more of a return by buying bonds or buying some stocks to pay a dividend or, you know, you buy property that yields something, if you have positive yielding markets, gold tends to not do well. But now in the last couple of weeks with the yield staying higher and gold now making it, but now silver and the miners starting to go with it, there's been all these pundits now saying, well, why? This is, you know, gold has decoupled from real yields and this is all new and why is this happening? And, you know, everybody's trying to figure out why this is. And I'll tell you, I, I to, it's not a shocker to me at all. And, you know, what I would do is just reference, you know, the very first interview I gave 
uh, regarding my framework, which, you know, has been come to be known as the dollar milkshake theory, is that we would get into a time where bonds would break. As a result, the yields would be hot rise. As yields rose, that would pull capital into the dollar. It would make it stronger versus its fiat peers. As it got stronger versus its fiat peers, that would draw capital into the dollar. That would then pull capital into the United States. But if they're selling out of bonds, that's got to go somewhere. That then goes into equities. And as the dollar is higher versus relative fiat, that starts to cause problems around the world. As you know, yields start to rise, that causes problems around the world. So then you get the dollar rising because of higher yields and a safety trade. You get U.S. equities rising because people are leaving bonds, but they still want to be in the U.S. And now you get gold rising along with the dollar and U.S. equities because it's a chaos trade or because it's a safety trade or because it's a all fiats be devalued trade. And it's a, it's a store of value trade. And so to me, this is what we've had this last couple of weeks or year to date, however you want to kind of frame that is kind of what the milkshake is all about. Now, that doesn't mean that we're in the final chapter, and it doesn't mean that all that is going to continue in a straight line exactly like that for the next four or five years. But again, this is not surprising to me at all, because this is kind of the framework that I laid out several years ago and that I thought would eventually happen. And so I think we're kind of getting into it. Now, I said in that same interview, listen, you can't just you know, buy a few things and sit back and relax, because there's going to be these devastating drawdowns along the way. So you need to have a plan. For these devastating drawdowns as well, but you know, I, I think that's largely where we're at uh, with the markets right now. We're 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 in one of these periods where we we've, we've risen up. We're probably now due for some kind of devastating drawdowns or scary drawdowns. Maybe they won't be devastating, but maybe they'll be scary. And maybe maybe that fear will last for a couple of days or a couple of weeks. But you know, markets don't move in a straight line. Um, you know, I, I've, I've said for years that gold will eventually get to five thousand dollars. I've said for years that the Dow will eventually get to sixty thousand um, dollars. I've said for years that the dollar will go to its all-time high of one fifty. That doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. I think you have to be ready for it to happen tomorrow, but it's probably going to take another four or five years for this all to play out. But we're definitely in kind of what we're in. We're in, we're in an ascending part of of that thesis. Uh, but I think people now, because everybody kind of feels like they're bulletproof now. Equity people feel like they're bulletproof. Bitcoin people feel like they're bulletproof. Gold people feel like they're bulletproof. Silver people think they're, you know, Superman all of a sudden. And, you know, nobody thinks that they can get hurt. But, you know, just about the time you think that nobody can get hurt, that's when you do. And that's uh, that's all of these things. The reason I know these things is because I've made all these mistakes. I'm not trying to be up on the soapbox preaching to everybody. I'm smarter than you. You need to listen to me because otherwise you, all these bad things are going to happen. I'm saying this because these things have happened to me. I've made these mistakes. And in many ways, my whole framework and kind of these things I talk about, this is the these are the rules I've built for myself over time and the framework I've built over time to help me manage the emotions. You know, one of the things, you know, John, when you and I started this whole whole channel is we wanted to talk about the madness, right? And we're seeing the madness this week. People are very excited. They're over there over the moon that, that their thesis is finally starting to play. And again, it doesn't matter whether it's crypto, whether it's equities, whether it's NVIDIA, whether it's gold, silver, the miners, like everything is surging and everybody is confident. And, you know, that's about the time that you really kind of need to, to, to kind of step back and, 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 and think about things because that's when your framework is most important. That's when the rules you've set up during the calm periods are supposed to help you. And I will tell you, from an emotional perspective, I'm a gold bug. So I'm like, this is pretty exciting. I can see gold or gold 5,000, but I've built these rules that help me manage those emotions. And I got to tell you, if you have a framework and you have the rules, it makes this so much easier because it takes a lot of the emotion out of it. And that's what a framework and that's what the rules are supposed to. They're supposed to remove the emotion because there's nothing more dangerous in markets than emotion. Well, there's been no shortage of emotion, as you were saying. It's been emotional watching the emotion, mainly because of everything you just said, there's been this um, sense of, of invincibility from everyone. And it, it feels like this is where the blind side comes. Now, you've also been very, um, I think, grounded in your warnings as well. It, it, there hasn't been really much of a time that, you know, we've been doing the show, particularly 
this the the season two this year where there's any there's really ever been any kind of like hyper bearish or fear mongering it's just using your framework looking at you know kind of where things have gotten a little bit over their skis and saying generally you think things are going higher but in order for for that to happen we need a little bit of a pullback so things can recoil it's been a very grounded approach to where some defense could make sense but unfortunately in these environments like we have right now where some people's ideologies are playing out in their favor they very quickly forget about all the pain that not only they may have experienced but everyone else who's been in that trade for five ten or more years has been experiencing along the way so it's great it certainly plays into something you've been talking about for six years with the dollar milkshake theory you've got gold up now and it's playing out from a narrative standpoint exactly as that framework has discussed but anyone who hasn't had that framework who's just had a religion and has been going in all in on one thing or the other whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's gold or silver, there's been a lot of pain along the way. Um, do you want to address some of that? Because I think that's one of the, yeah. the most frustrating things for me all week is watching people get on their soapbox, knowing how much damage has been caused up to this point. Yeah, and this is, this, okay, so th there's a couple things here and I want, I'm probably going to need to walk through them step by step because I want to get to all of them. But this is honestly part of the reason I wanted to start this channel is to kind of be able to talk about this stuff in a way that's a little bit more nuanced. It's a little bit more rational and it's, and, and, and perhaps in part some, some wisdom along the way. And I'm going to steal a line from Rick rule. I think Rick rule, I think he said maybe the best line I've ever heard at, a, at an investment conference several years ago. He said, he said, to use my scar tissue to improve the performance of your portfolio. And what he was saying is he's like saying, listen, guys, I've been around a few times. I've seen a few things. I've made all the mistakes. So if you use my pain to make your portfolio better so you don't have to feel the pain. And so when I come on here and I talk about things to be aware of and things to look out for, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm tr I have, listen, I have the scar tissue. <laughs> I guarantee you I have the scar tissue. But that scar tissue comes with experience and, and learning some things. And so... And so the reason I bring this up now is somebody this week, I don't remember exactly where, it was probably Twitter, it might have been you know an email or something, but somebody said, I don't see a lot of value because Brent says, yeah, on gold, but then all he ever does is warn about pullbacks. And same thing with silver. He never, he said he's never called the breakouts in silver. All he says is be careful, they're going to come back down. So I'm sitting here thinking, well, that's because silver hasn't broken out. In 2020, it went to 30 bucks after COVID. And then it came back down to 20 bucks. And then it went to 28 when Putin invaded Russia or Putin invaded Ukraine. And then it came back to 20 bucks. And then last year again, it went to 26 bucks. And then it came back down to 20 bucks. And now we're at 27. So it's basically gone on this five year apparel rimage every year to 25 to 26 to $27. And then it pulls back. And every year for those five years, there were people when we're right where we are right now saying, you got to get in. This is it. You have to, you know, you, you, the train is leaving the station. You're never going to get another chance. And then literally two months later, you have the chance again. Now, the same thing happened in October. There was a guy on Twitter said, you know, you got to get in now. And I think you may remember this. We were saying that we were, we were. I'm, I'm going to get into this in a little bit on my process on gold. And we were very close to a major washout in gold and silver and the miners. But because I already own a position, I didn't go and buy more at that level. I think gold was around 18, 15, 1900 bucks. And if we would have gone to these really, really low levels, like a total washout, tactically, I probably would have bought more. And I think we even talked on here, I was a little annoyed because gold started to rally before we got to that total washout level. But my process said, don't buy at that level. And so, but the point is, is if I bought gold years ago at 1850 and somebody else bought gold in October of 1850, I've made the exact same amount of money from 1850 to now as the person that bought in October. So, you know, it's not that I miss it. It's not that I wasn't on board. It's that the process already had me in the position. And so, but now we've got people saying, 
this is it. If you don't get in the sound money now, you're going to get hurt. Well, okay, if you don't own any gold or silver right now, then you, you should probably own some and you should have bought it, <laughs> you know, when things were calmer. Hopefully, you know, when we, you know, talk about these things and literally every interview that I've done for the last two or three years, I said, when at the end of the conversation, I said, well, Brent, what do you think people should own? How should they be positioned? I literally start every time I say this, everybody should own gold. So if you don't understand that that translates into, I should, you should go buy gold. I, I, you know, I don't know what else to tell you, but that's about as clear as I can be. Everybody should own it. But I also don't think that everybody should only own gold. And I think that is what's gotten people in trouble. And so I was having some conversations this week where people were saying, I was saying, you know, let's be careful. Don't go too crazy. You know, the people that are now calling for this breakout now have called for all the previous breakouts. So just be careful. That space, that was basically my warning. Kind of like this other person said, is all he ever does is, you know, all about the warnings. Well, it's because we haven't had the full on breakout to a new bull market yet. But, you know, but I was having this conversation and, and I said, you know, people have gotten hurt buying at these levels in the past. And, and the answer was, well, what are you talking about? Gold's doubled in the last 10 years. Where's the pain? Well, that's very disingenuous because anybody who's been involved in the gold trade over the last few years, especially if you were involved in the miners or silver, um, some of the other precious, you know, palladium lineup, there has been immense pain in that sector. And to pretend that there hasn't is just, it's crazy. Of course there has been. And unfortunately, you know, I would go to these gold conferences, these investment conferences, these natural resource conferences, and I would talk to investors. And they would have 40, 50, 60, 70% of their portfolio in gold, silver, the miners, and resource stocks. And listen, if you're young, or if you have a second source of income, or if you have a long, long time horizon with another liquidity source that you can ride out a 10-year bear market, that's great. But I used to talk to people that were 60 years old, 65 years old, either moving towards retirement or in retirement. And they had 70% of their portfolio in gold miners that were down 70%. And you know what? They're still down 70%. And somebody that they got crushed and, and they, you know, that was 10 years ago. They're now 78 or 80 years old and they've, they had to sell at the bottom in order to pay rent. And so again, I'm not saying that people shouldn't own gold here. I think everybody should own gold here. I'm not saying you shouldn't have some miners in your portfolio. Sure. But to go all in at these levels. And to say that if you're not all in at these levels, well, then you're going to get hurt. I think it's really bad advice. And so I, I'm, I'm kind of particularly sensitive to that because I've talked to so many people who have gotten hurt. Um, now, this is not Brent hating on gold. I don't know how to be more clear. I'm a huge gold. I think gold will ultimately help you, if not save you. But gold is not going to make you be flying around in a private jet while everybody else is working, you know, at, at, at McDonald's. Gold might help you, you know, maintain your lifestyle, but it's not going to make you rich while everybody else is poor. And now they're working for you because when gold goes to 5,000, it's not going to be a pretty world that we're all living in. Uh, but one thing I thought I would do, and I know, I know I'm kind of rambling now, and I know I'm kind of pounding the, the table, but I, I think this is so important. And so one of the things I thought I would do is talk about the framework a little bit, not the dollar milkshake framework, but the framework with gold. Again, I think everybody should own gold. So let's say you have 10% of your portfolio in gold. Now I know there's a lot of people, a lot of gold bucks have again, 20, 30, 40, 50% of their portfolio in gold. I think in general, I think a good allocation of gold is anywhere from 10 to 25%, depending on who you are what your other sources of income are, what your age is, what your risk tolerance. I don't think you need more than 25. You probably need at least 10. That's kind of just a general statement. But here's the thing. And so most of my clients have an allocation somewhere in that range. And that's kind of like a physical goal. It's kind of a long-term strategic allocation. It doesn't really matter to me with that allocation, whether gold's at a thousand bucks or 3,000 bucks. That's what we're holding. That's in, you know, if we get into some kind of a scenario where we need to liquidate it in some kind of emergency, well, that's what it's for. It's an insurance policy. It's kind of the, the, you know, Armageddon trade, so to speak. But trading gold along the way, we also have an allocation 
in our portfolio, the where we do tactical trades, we do tactical trades in commodities and equities and bonds and gold, you know, crypto, whatever it is, we have the tactical trades. And so I will tactically trade around gold or silver or, you know, the miners, if I think they are extended and I will, or, or if I think that they're totally washed out. So, and I think there's a, there's a couple ways that you can do this. So if right now I'll, I'll give you some, these, and these are very simple things. This, this isn't like rocket science, but this is a very simple framework that has really helped me be in gold and, and have that strategic position, but then, you know, trade around it a little bit. So right now gold has a relative strength. That's, a, that, that's as high as it's been in the last four or five years. Okay. Now I think it's spiked a little bit higher when you, again, when, when Russia invaded um, Ukraine. But again, it's it, the, the, the relative strength is very high. Typically, the best time to buy is when relative strength is very low. Buy low, sell high, right? That's one thing. The other thing is that you typically want to buy when sentiment is in the gut. Well, right now, sentiment, and again, this is a very simple sentiment indicator that I follow. The sentiment on gold is 90 and the sentiment on silver is 91. Anything above 90 or below 10 is extreme. Really, anything above 85 or below 50 is kind of washout territory or very high territory. So I'm always looking to buy below 15 or sell. Again, these are tactical trades above 85. And if you get above 90 or below 10, that's when you kind of have the green light to be a little more aggressive. So right now we have the RSI on gold, silver, and the miners very high. We have the 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 sentiment indicator is basically at extreme levels. Um, we've got people losing their minds on Twitter <laughs> and we've got to, you know, it's kind of an overall emotional market. And then you start looking at things like positioning. And that's when you look at the COT report, the, the COT report talks about commitment of traders. And this is where you can see the speculators versus the commercials. The commercials are the big banks and they're the hedgers and the speculators are what the, what the name implies. It's the people that are trying to make money from a short term trade. And right now the speculators are very high. And the, the commercials are, are and they're very long and the commercials are short. Now, it is not yet to extreme territories, but it's certainly not bullish positioning. And the, here's the thing is these reports come out a week delayed. So we just got one on Friday, which is actually four or five days old. So we won't get, and so it didn't have a lot of the big run up in gold and silver that we saw over the last three days. And if we go higher in the next week, we won't know until Friday what those look like. But the point is, is you've now got gold very high. You've got the commercials very short. Typically, those reverse at some point. Um, now, it, they don't have to, but they typically do. So again, if I am, already have a, a strategic gold position, but I'm also looking to either edge that strategic gold position, or if I'm looking to do some tactical trades along the way, last October, everything was reversed. Sentiment was very low. Relative strength was very low. They were kind of unloved. And that's what I was telling you. We, I remember I said we were very close to this total washout, in which case I probably would have gone tactically long. But now we're at the polar opposite. Now sentiment is as high as it's been. Uh, relative strength is very high. There's so much momentum into it. If you are just now buying gold for the first time, and you're buying physical and it's kind of a long-term position, then that's fine. Everybody needs to own gold. But if you are just now tactically trying to get in, I'm not saying gold can't go higher. Maybe it does. Maybe we wake up on Monday morning and gold is $5,000. I'm just saying this is the environment where you get the strong pullbacks. So anybody that's buying now thinking that this is it, it's different this time, maybe it is. But the arguments being made now are the same arguments that have been made every year for the last five years last 10 years, last 15 years. And so it so typically doesn't work out well when you buy at these levels. And that's what I, when I'm on Twitter or when I'm on an interview and I say, these are the things you need to think about, or hey, may, maybe think about this. I'm trying to get people to think. I'm trying to get people to like understand that not everything goes up in a straight process. And maybe people don't like the way I ask the question. Maybe they don't like my sarcasm, but I really am trying to kind of impart some of these things that might help your portfolio, you know, kind of go up and to the right at a little more consistent pace. Well, relative strength, the RSI, you know, very much a um, 
trusted sentiment indicator. I wonder if Elon is missing out on an opportunity by not curating a TSI, some sort of Twitter sentiment indicator. <laughs> Cause I feel like, I feel like there'd be some value in being able to, um, you know, cultivate that data in a way that's similar to the, to the cot and, and the RSI where, where, where we could actually measure that numerically. But, you know, one of the things and everything that you're talking about, it, it, it's great. I want to, um, focus in on two parts. One is it's important to understand that one of the first times you really were public with the dollar milkshake theory goes all the way back to around 2018. And, and we'll have um, in our show notes a link to where you can watch a video you did about a year later that that I think is a bit more, um, you know, you did a presentation which has been on our channel forever and then you did more of like an interview that was cut together. So um, people can process the whole the whole journey, even for you, you know, sharing it at a conference and then sharing it in a more edited format. But that was 2018, that was six years ago, right? So you had an opportunity to buy things by leveraging a framework of where you thought they were going to be. And, and so what a lot of people should be doing is establishing a framework for today on where they think things are going to be six years from now. So they're not in this situation like you just described where they're responding to emotion um, or even back in 2018, you know, where they were responding to emotion then, but not doing so with a framework. And they went through years and years of pain. And, and you know, as far as the, um, the gold bugs and everything that's been going on, the other point I want to make is there, I think for me, it's, it's more, it feels more about being right. As you, as you, as you like to point out, like there's more of this, um, the, the intention is more about, you know, having the narrative proven right or their belief system proven right because although gold and silver is doing uh, a nice little run right now you can't negate what it didn't do for the last two years or so as you know equity markets ripped higher and you can't then negate its underperformance as much as gold bugs are going to hate me for saying this versus something like a bitcoin so it, it's it's great that it fit, fits into a portfolio such as yours because you have a framework of why it's there but the thing for me is, um, you know, going back and summarizing what I'm um, presenting here is one, where do you th see things going, you know, six, five, six years from now? What, how, how are you adjusting your framework? Is there a new dollar milkshake theory framework that you have? Um, today in the current market, how would you, even if it's just a thought experiment, be a contrarian? What, what do you think right now is a very contrarian thing that people aren't thinking about? Whether you believe it to be possible or not, how would you just play devil's advocate entirely? And then ultimately this idea of, of narrative and, and how much right now people are more about cheerleading an idea versus what the asset classes are actually doing underneath. Yeah, so there's, there's probably three things there that, that I'll, I'll try to address. So the first thing I'll say is, I think, and I don't know for sure, but I think the dollar milkshake framework is still the right framework for the next, call it four or five years. And I'll tell you why. I thought it was right back in 2018 and 19. And even though it had, I haven't gotten everything right. If you, again, if you go back and you listen to that, that interview that I said, and listen to the 15 minute mark, the 20 minute mark, and then look and see what's happened over the last four or five years. It's not totally wrong. Now, it might not be 100% right, but that has helped me stay invested and make money, even though I didn't get everything right along the way. And the point I would make with this, and we've talked about this before, is I think if people stopped trying to get everything exactly right and just try to be prepared for almost everything, I think their portfolios are going to do a lot better. So I think the dollar milkshake theory is still the right framework. Now, the dollar milkshake theory ultimately says the dollar is going to continue to rise versus other fiat, but it's not about just buying the dollar. It's about understanding what the dollar going higher does to markets and then being positioned correctly in other assets other than the dollar to take advantage of that. Now, here's the thing, is if, the, if, if I am wrong, because essentially I say everybody should own gold, everybody should own U.S. equities, everybody should own... Um, you know, some short-term cash, whether it's T-bills or something else. Um, and you kind of be, kind of have a diversified portfolio, kind of be ready um, for, for, for what's happened. 
if I'm wrong and the dollar doesn't get stronger and they come out and they devalue it or they inflate it away and I'm wrong that the U.S. is the best place on a relative basis and that, you know, fiat currency, the, the, the fiat currency of the dollar falls versus its fiat peers, then hard assets that we own, the real estate that we own, the gold that we own, the U.S. equities that we own, if, if the dollar's going to 85 or 75 or whatever it is, that's a pretty good environment for all those assets we own to go up. Now, I would rather make money than be right. Now, ultimately, of course, I want to I want to be both, right? I want to be right and make money. But if I had to choose between the two, I'd all take the money, right? And this is the thing is, I should have mentioned this earlier. I think a lot of people right now are feeling so bulletproof because again, whether you're a Bitcoin guy or a gold guy or an equity guy or a bond bear, like every you're getting your confirmation. Your price is confirming your bias right now. And that is pride talking to you. And the whole point of having part of the reason that I, my pride forced me to build this framework because I know I have an ego. And I, I don't mind admitting that. And I, and here's the thing. If you, if you think you don't have an ego, you're at a disadvantage because you do. I don't think you can do this job without having an ego. So if you don't have a framework to keep your ego in check, your ego is going to get you the better of you at some point. And so my whole framework is really a way of keeping my ego in check because I know I have one and I can give everybody a perfect example because I know people say, well, Brent, in the fall of 2022, when the dollar was really high, you were losing your mind too. You were acting crazy. You thought you were bulletproof. And you know what? You're absolutely right. I did feel that way. And that is when I leaned on my framework more than ever because I knew I was guilty of all the things I'm warning everybody else to be guilty for. And my framework and the rules I put in place forced me to say, you know what? The dollar's probably topping. And if you think that I'm lying, there is a tweet I put out literally within two hours of the high. I think it was September 29th of 2022 saying that's probably it for the dollar for a while. And I didn't like sending out that tweet. My pride was like, we are going to all time highs. But my process and the rules I set for myself kind of, and part of the, part of the reason I tweeted it out was to make myself accountable to it. Because otherwise I could just say, oh yeah, yeah, I could, I, I'm sort of paying attention to my framework, but I'm, you know, maybe I'll just ignore it today. But I sent the tweet out in order to solidify that I'm listening to my framework. And so that's, you know, okay, so now let's come back to your question. What's the framework for the next several years? I really think that the framework that I've used for the last four or five years is the right framework for the next four or five years. And the reason is, is I think that COVID changed everything. COVID kicked the can down the road and it kicked the can down the road hard. And I think it kicked the can down the hard road two or three years, maybe four years. And so what I see playing out right now in the markets is kind of what I thought would have played out in the 20 to 21 timeframe. But because of COVID happened in 2020, I think it kicked everything down the road. So now we're I see the, the the milkshake framework is playing out, but I think we're at the point now where everything has risen. We're probably at the point where we're going to... I, I talked about assets are going to trend up and to the right. The dollar is going to rise versus its peers. But there's going to be drawdowns along the way, perhaps terrifying drawdowns along the way. We've had a pretty good run higher in just about everything. It's probably time for a drawdown along the way. Now, I've been saying that for a while. You know, we talked about last year... Early part of last year, I was expecting one. We got it in September. I thought we'd rally a little bit, and I thought we'd get another one. We haven't got the second one yet. I think it's time for that. But again, the framework has allowed me to stay invested, so we're not just sitting on the sidelines waiting, but it's also what's keeping me kind of grounded and saying, you know what, we've had the run up. We're probably due for a run down. Um, but if I am wrong, and this isn't the framework, because I've never thought that we're just going to go straight up and to the right in the dollar or gold or equities or whatever it is for four or five years. Markets don't move like that. Markets move up and down. And there's gonna and the other thing is I know I'm not going to get hundred percent right. But if 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 we get it just a little bit of right and talk about just survive in advance, I think if people just survive the next five years, they're probably going to be better than a lot of people because I think a lot of people are, are going to get hurt. 
But if I was wrong, I think where I would be wrong is if we don't have a crisis. Maybe things are going to get better. And that's the other thing. You know, if you look at a long-term chart of assets, they go up and to the right. And so I had to figure out how do I get a framework? How do I get a rule-based system that allows me to participate in assets that go up and to the right, but that doesn't get crushed during these inevitable drawdowns? And so I've been pretty conservative. So I think if I got things wrong over the next four or five years, it would because we'll still make money, but we won't make as much money as if we were artful, hard or bullish on everything because things are getting better. And I think that is a I think that's a possibility. I don't think it's a huge probability, but I think it's a higher possibility than a lot of people think it is because I think there's so many power bears out there that think things cannot possibly get better. The U.S. cannot possibly stay on top. Uh, But maybe, maybe we do kind of have some energy breakthrough, right? And we can kind of start to grow our way out of um, all this debt that we have. Maybe this AI revolution really is going to transform industry and a new technology that comes in and makes things everything more efficient will again allow for more growth. It'll allow us to kind of grow our way out of some of these problems that are created for ourselves. Maybe the world will realize that we're on a collision course for something that is just not good and nobody's going to win. And maybe it'll be like in 63 when Khrushchev and Kennedy had their big face off in, you know, the water's not too far from here. And, you know, everybody turned around and went home. And then we had, uh, you know, some good years. Uh, maybe that'll happen. Maybe, maybe we'll, we'll get some kind of a peace deal with Russia and in Ukraine. Maybe, you know, the Israel and Gaza can kind of figure out some kind of a solution that doesn't allow that to go off the rails. Maybe. You know, the U.S. and China will say, you know what, this is ridiculous. Nobody's going to win this. We've got to figure out a way. And I, and again, that's not my framework. That's not my, that's not my base case. I, I actually think very hard the other way, but I don't rule it out either. And I, and I wouldn't say that's impossible. And if that, if, 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 if even one or two of those things happen, that could change a lot of things. Would we say that that's your contrarian take then on, you know, you see the framework of the milkshake continuing uh, but where you might get it wrong is that it could be going more utopian for everybody. Um, or is there something happening right now? Or based on what's happening right now, is there something so extreme? Um, again, it, I'm, I'm giving you permission to just be almost ridiculous here with w- what would be a contrarian take. This would be very contrarian for me. It wouldn't be contrarian. Uh, it would be very contrarian for me. I think it would be contrarian for most people, but it wouldn't be contrarian at all for many people on FinTwit and in the gold community, which is what we've kind of been talking about tonight. And that is maybe the U.S. proactively devalues the dollar or proactively works to make the dollar a lot weaker. I don't think that they are doing that right now. And I don't think that they, even if they go back to QE, that's not devaluing the dollar on a wholesale basis. I'm talking about something like, you know, going off the gold standard or a plaza accord, if they proactively, you know, in some kind of a very systematic fashion, took the dollar index from 105 to 75 over the next two years, and they publicly stated that was their policy and that was their intention, then I'm just totally wrong. And the milkshake framework is completely wrong, right? Now, I think there's a lot of people in the gold world or the Bitcoin world who thinks, yeah, that's it. You know, they've got to go back. They got to print the money. But the reality is right now, the rest of the world is printing more money than the United States. Um, the U.S. has tighter monetary policy than most everywhere else. China is in the process of devaluing their currency. China is in the process of starting, you know, some kind of, a, they don't call it QE, but it's basically QE. Um, you know, Z has been encouraging the, the Bank of China to trade, you know, Chinese government bonds. Now, I don't think he's encouraging the, the Chinese central bank to sell Chinese government bonds. So trade is kind of a euphemism for buy. Um, so again, that's not my framework. I, I don't think that the U.S. is going to unilaterally devalue the dollar. Um, but I can't rule it out. But that that would certainly be kind of a surprise to a lot of people other than the people in the gold and the, the Bitcoin world. All right. So you were talking a, a, a moment ago about this. I'll frame it as a utopian scenario, right? Because even if you're bullish on the future, what you laid out is, you know, almost too perfect to, to really unfold that way. 
But one of the things, you know, to kind of bring it back to macro before we wrap up here and talk about next week's data, um, we started the show talking about non-farm payroll. Um, that was a, a key data set that came out this week amidst all the other um, kind of craziness that was going on with asset prices. And the employment report has been consistently uh, surprising. These large multiple sigma moves outside of the standard deviation of what people expected the number to be. Um, and then we also see big revisions afterwards. But you would think, I, to me personally, I feel like this, this print, um, to have this many surprises, you have to stop and, and potentially ask yourself, what are we getting wrong? Is this just the Biden administration messing with the numbers to paint a picture because it, it, they think that's going to help them in the election? That's a really you know, easy narrative to get behind. But when you, you see this continually happening and when you look under the data and there's um, no full time jobs being added, it's all part time. And then you kind of take this utopian scenario that you're talking about. You know, the one of the things that people look at from a data set standpoint where they're talking recession is when you have these really strong employment numbers, when you're at full employment, technically, you know, you're in these low five percent ranges and it's not really going anywhere. That's just right before when the recession happens. And it's not because, you know, strong employment causes recession. It's just you've been in this Goldilocks scenario for so right. long that eventually, you know, the credit cycles they run their course, people get over their skis, they take too much risk, someone defaults, there's all this counterparty risk, and then you have this domino effect, which ultimately, you know, a recession based on those types of events is really what you, you're, you're explaining the dollar milkshake is when you have these outside events, there's a shortage of collateral and everyone scampers for the dollar. But going back to the, the employment data, you know, we, we have potentially a situation here where you know, there's part time jobs. Maybe this is the new economy and, and maybe it actually creates, um, you know, greater opportunities for people because they're able to hold down a semi steady job. And they're at the same time able to pursue these other opportunities, which ultimately increases GDP. I think that's a very valid point. And, you know, I, I, I've talked about this before and maybe someday we'll even have him on the show. My friend, Todd, you know, I talked to again. I, I love talking to Tom because he's He's just so grounded and so calm about everything. And he's like, you know what? Things aren't that bad. And the realities, they're not that bad. But I, to, to your point, maybe maybe we've got this economy that's changing, but change isn't necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, there's growing pain. Yeah, if you're used to seeing something some way and those things aren't happening anymore, and those old things that used to happen were the signal that things were good, and now and now you're not getting those same signals that used to say they were good, but Maybe those aren't appropriate. Maybe that's not the right way to look at things anymore. And so I'm not saying this is the case, so I'm saying I can't rule it out. So maybe the, the economy is just transitioning. Maybe there's going to be some growing pains, but maybe it's going to be okay, right? And my thing with the economy now is it's not that bad. My framework and my understanding of how the monetary system is designed helps me understand that even though I don't think things are bad or that bad right now, I understand how they can get really bad really quickly. In a debt-based monetary system, things can go bad really quickly. Now, it doesn't mean that they're going to, but it just means that it can happen really quickly. And so when I look at all the stuff that, that historically has been a red flag, and when I understand where we're at from a debt perspective, and I understand where we're at from a geopolitical perspective, I cannot manage money with a long bias without having some kind of protection on the downside. But that doesn't guarantee the downside's going to come, right? And if it does come, maybe it doesn't come for another six months. Maybe it doesn't come for another two or three years. You know, Adam Taggart has a podcast series that's called Thoughtful Money. And, and I think Adam's a great guy. I think he's a wonderful interviewer. And he had... Um, who did he, he had somebody on recently who's very kind of optimistic and he, you know, he's laid out all his reasons why he thinks, you know, we're kind of in a bull market and it might last another year or two. And his name is, uh, Yardini, Ed Yardini, but it was a great interview because, you know, he talked about some of the stuff that we're talking about. He says, yeah, that stuff could pop up. That could cause some problems. Maybe we're going to have some hiccups, but it's also possible that, you know, things are okay for the next year or two. I thought that was a great episode of why not to get too bearish and why, 
you know, to, to have an open mind and why things might be okay for longer than you think they're going to. All right. Well, let's take that before we wrap up here. Um, so much of, of this year's tug of war and clearly based on what we're seeing in the markets and what we've talked about in this conversation, the bulls are winning that tug of war, but so much of it has come down to what monetary policy is going to be. Um, and specifically the potential for fed rate cuts. Now, next week, um, we have the most important CPI in history, um, <laughs> as we often like to say, because CPI, which is measuring inflation, that inflation metric is, is really going to be what drives Fed policy, although they really want to cut because one would say they're choking out the banking sector and there's other factors that are um, knock on effects from their, their current higher rate and tighter monetary policy. But without the inflation data to corroborate that, they're, they're probably not going to cut. So what are your expectations next week on, on some of the data we have on deck, uh, specifically the CPI? Listen, if I have to, so it's a, we've got a bunch of data and we've got the Fed minutes. So we've got a lot of stuff. So here's the thing, there's this last week, because last week was volatile, but everything kind of ended near the end of the, to, towards the high end. But it does feel like the market has gotten just a little bit wobbly. Not, I wouldn't say it again, I'm not, I'm not predicting it, but it's gotten a little bit wobblier over the last week or so than it had been kind of earlier in the year. And now we've got a bunch of data this week and we've got the Fed minutes. If the Fed minutes come out, and again, they're more hawkish than people are excited. People know that they want the cut. But if, if, if the language isn't as dovish as they're wanting it to be, and you get a hot CPI print and then you get a hot PPE towards, I think it's on Thursday or Friday. And then we've got another three weeks until the Fed meeting. You could get some volatility between, you know, let's call it Monday and the first part of May. So, you know, I, I've said this a long time. I, I think we need some kind of a, a jolt to kind of reset expectations a little bit, not from an interest rate perspective, but just from a risk reward perspective. I think everybody feels bulletproof right now. And again, you know, I, did, I just kind of feel like we're kind of the mark. The mar, it's kind of like the wild, wild rest right now. People are walking around with guns on their hips and feeling really brave, but somebody's going to get shot. And uh, whether that's this week or next week, I don't know. But, you know, I feel like we've got a showdown coming up in the next couple of weeks. All right. We'll see who ends up showing up as Billy the Kid. Uh, maybe it's the Fed. Maybe it's some other market that we didn't expect. Maybe it's the bond market. Maybe the bond market comes yeah. in as, as the sheriff in town. We'll see. Look, if you want to um, du duke it out, um, have a, a drawdown, a face off with Brent, you can do that on Twitter at Santiago AU Fund. You can find me there at John Katsmita. You can find this show as well at Milkshakes Pod on Twitter and on YouTube. Uh, we appreciate everyone joining us. Uh, stay tuned for more announcements on some things that we have in the works. Until then, enjoy your weekend and a good luck with the week coming up. Keep cool heads and uh, keep the money in your pocket. Talk to everybody real soon. This show is provided for entertainment and informational purposes only. It should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. Neither the hosts, guests, nor any funds they may manage intends to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies.